Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I'm happy to introduce Ali Rahimi from Intel Labs Berkeley. Hi. I'm going to talk about random kitchen sinks, uh, but before I get into it, I want to just make sure everybody can pace themselves uh, through the talk. I'm going to start with really lightweight stuff, and then, and then we're going to ramp up slowly, and then I'll do experiments, and you can turn your minds off, and then I'll hit you again with some math, and then, and then this is new work, and it's not published, so try to breeze through it, but it's still pretty mathy. I'm going to start here. So this is to give you a little bit of context about where all this work comes from. So this is a new trend in AI. Back in the day, when we wanted to build smart things, we would start with a really complicated statistical model, like Bayes nets, where, where inference was NP-hard and, and learning was even NP-harder. And, and we gave it some data and you know a few thousand examples and and we trained some intelligent thing and something happened in the late 90s where instead of models like this these really structured statistical models we started using more generic models non-parametric models like rbfs and um, and to compensate for the lack of statistical structure in these models we started feeding these models lots and lots of data domain knowledge started coming from here instead of from here and the nice thing about these generic models is that the optimization problems tend to be convex. At least they're in P. Um, but because we have so much data, the optimization problem in practice ends up uh, taking a lot of time. So this talk is really about tricks for making these types of optimization problems on these types of data sets go faster to support the new kind of artificial intelligence that, that we're doing these days. So I'll give you a few examples of this trend from here to here. Um, here's an example from Alyosha Efros. Uh, this is a problem where you want to, you give it an image, you say, oh, I really don't like these houses being here. So you blot them out. And then you want to fill in this blotted out part with something pretty irrelevant. So Alyosha, these days, takes a very data heavy approach. He just crawls through millions of images through, in Flickr and finds little patches and substitutes the patches in here. It's a very heavy weight, heavy, heavy data-driven approach. Contrast this with something he did um, 10 years ago where he actually had a pretty sophisticated HMM-based model, um, not very data-driven, but the model was a lot more complicated. Um, this works a lot better. Uh, here's, another, here's another example. Uh, this is work from Antonio Toralba. Uh, here's, um, each of these little cells is a, is a tiny image. There's 10 million images in here. And he uses this data set to do object recognition. Okay? Extremely data heavy. The, the operation that he goes through is just the nearest neighbor search in, in, in these 10 million images. Uh, compare that with what he did a while back, where um, they actually build these, this pretty complicated discriminative model that, in, that, that took into account the spatial relationships between objects and um, wasn't trained on that much data. This works really well. Uh, here's another example uh, from Greg Shachnorovich. Um, here's a pose detector. I hear Microsoft recently solved this problem on the Xbox. Um, so you, the, the, the goal is to recover the 3D pose of a, of a human body. Um, and Greg's approach here is he, he, he takes a graphic simulator, generates 150,000 examples of a, of a fake person under random different poses and just matches this image against this image using, using a very simple distance metric. Contrast this with um, something the same group did um, 10 years ago that involved actually reasoning about the 3D geometry of the shape in real time and trying to match it against the 2D image and reco recover um, the 3D shape of the body. This works amazingly well and it's fast. Um, my own motivation for this stuff is is building object recognition systems that you can train on, that can recognize millions of, of objects in, in, in your real world. Um, so you know, this is, this is the system trained on about 30 objects. Um, and you know, it runs in real time, but as you scale the number of objects, 
Um, it goes more and more slowly, and the accuracy drops. So it would be neat to take systems like this and be able to scale them up just the same way those previous examples I'd, I'd, I'd showed you um, work. Part of the reason this trend is happening now is that we have access to a lot more data than we did before, I think. I'm, I'm speculating here. Uh, we have really high fidelity simulators, like the simu graphic simulator that Greg was using to generate these body poses. Um, we have the web that has lots of images and annotations on it. And ever since the MacArthur Foundation started giving grants to people for building games, um, there's a lot of, and, and Mechanical Turks too, there's a lot of uh, hand annotated stuff that you get off of the, off of the web. So this talk is about supporting this trend. And I'm going to show you two tricks that, that, that I've been playing with. Um, I'll start with the random features trick. This is a way to speed up kernel machines. Um, so a little bit of background on kernel machines. Um, here's a classification task. Okay, so this is a trick for, for speeding up your classifier. Um, and I'm going to tell you about the classification problem a little bit. I'll tell you about the kernel machines, and I'll tell you about how we speed them up. So in this classification problem, you got um, a space, uh, a bunch of points. The points are labeled um, among the two classes. Um, and you're trying to find a decision surface between them. Um, linear decision surfaces don't always um, separate your two classes well. So one would like to consider nonlinear decision surfaces. And in kernel machine, the decision surface, the form of the decision surface that we use is, is a weighted sum of kernels placed on your on your training examples. Okay, so, so there are n parameters here. There's a kernel that we define, you know, maybe it's a Gaussian or something like that, and we place the kernel on each one of these points, and then we come up with a good weighting, and that, that'll describe a family of, of, non, of, of curves in this space. Um, so this is, turns out, I mean, this is well known, um, a function of this form when this kernel is positive definite is equivalent to a linear function in, in a featureized space of the input. Um, and these features uh, are such that they satisfy um, this relationship. So the kernel um, effectively maps the features, maps your inputs into some feature space, and then takes the inner product in those spaces. Okay, so this is uh, a review of, of kernel machines. And this is a really neat trick because Whereas you would normally be trying to fit a decision surface in an infinite dimensional space, right? So this, this feature, for example, in general could be an infinite dimensional feature mapping. Um, whereas you would normally have to uh, find an omega in some infinite dimensional space, um, this kernel trick lets you um, search for n parameters only. So you can start implementing these things inside computers, which is great. Um, and it even has this nice interpretation, like I said, in terms of instead of searching for curves like this, you map your data into a uh, pot potentially infinite dimensional space implicitly, and then learn a linear decision surface in that space. So this works really well. Um, the problem with these kernel machines is that they force you to deal with these enormous matrices. Okay. If you have 10 million training examples, um, one way or another, you're going to have to represent um, a 10 million by 10 million matrix whose entries consist of the kernel evaluated on pairs of your training data points. I made this really big to take up the whole screen so <laughs> to emphasize how big these matrices can be. Um, so you can do infinite dimensional things in finite dimensional computers with the kernel trick, but these things are still huge. Um, and so um, some researchers have come up with very popular tricks for dealing with matrices like this. Um, here's another trick. Okay. Uh, the trick is, well, we talked about how these kernels actually compute inner products um, between featureized inputs. So what we're going to do is instead of dealing with the kernel or with this infinite dimensional feature mapping, we're going to find a finite dimensional feature mapping, in fact, a low dimensional feature mapping such that instead of having to take this inner product in this infinite dimensional space, you can just take the dot product of the featureized inputs. Okay, so um, you know, just like just like um, with with kernel machines, your decision surface took this form. 
with this machine, because we're now using finite dimensional features, your kernel machine just takes this form. Okay, and to go back to this diagram, the idea again is we're gonna uh, to find these these nonlinear decision boundaries, we're gonna map our data into some finite dimensional, low dimensional space, and then train a linear decision boundary there. Um, and this mapping is gonna be such that this relationship holds, okay? So um, instead of training your kernel machine with kernels and dealing with these enormous matrices, we're actually gonna randomly featureize your inputs and then train a linear classifier in this relatively low dimensional space. Um, and we're gonna guarantee that that the resulting classifier is going to be close to the classifier we would have, we would have gotten. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about two, two different types of random features. Um, one of them are um, Fourier random features, and they're based on, on the Fourier transform of the kernel. And another one is a discrete random feature that's based on gridding up the space. I'll go through both of them. Um, the proof for why this works is really simple. It's four lines, and I I think it's kind of neat to look at. So I'm going to just pop, out, pop up some math, and I'm going to walk, walk through it, because this works. This is just really neat. Okay. So the trick is, we would like, we, we're given a kernel. Uh, I forgot to mention, this, this only works with shift invariant kernels. So, so you have to be able to represent the kernel like this. And at the bottom, we're going to get, we're going to derive these, these random features, such that this relationship holds. We want the inner product between the random, random featureized inputs to almost be equal to the value of the kernel. And I'll walk you through here, okay? So step one, take the Fourier transform of your kernel. Okay, so this is just the standard Fourier transform that you learn about in elementary school. Um, step two, so this is an integral. We're gonna replace the integral. Uh, so P is the Fourier transform, right, uh, of, of the kernel. We're gonna replace the integral by by approximating this, uh, this integral with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an average. Okay? So treat this Fourier transform as a probability distribution. Draw samples from it. Sorry, um, yes? Going through the previous notations where x's were vectors, you're now in a scalar space? No, x's are still vectors. OK, so these are multidimensional. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, this is, so omega prime is actually an inner product between omega and a vector x minus y. You want a weighted set of here, or in the sum? No, because I'm drawing um, from 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 p of. So so what I didn't what 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 I slipped under the the, the rug here is that because this kernel is positive definite, this the, the Fourier transform. So here's a theorem: the Fourier transform of the positive definite kernel is positive definite. Okay. This is Bachner's theorem. Um, you don't learn that in elementary school for some reason, but. Um, no. I, I, I meant, sorry, in, in, in systems and, and signals and systems, uh, in Alan Wilski's book that has all these free identities, this identity is not there, unfortunately. And it's a really powerful one. So, so the point is that we can treat this Fourier transform as a probability distribution. It's positive. You can sample from it. So let's approximate this integral using, using a sample average. Um, and now I'm just going to rewrite the summation. I'm going to split up each of these terms into a product. And then I'm going to write this in vector form. This vector depends only on x. This vector depends only on y. And we have our random features. Okay. So the Fourier random feature, really what it's doing is saying, if you want to compute k of x and y, take x, um, project that down into a random direction w. w is drawn from the Fourier transform of the kernel. So you take x, you project it down onto a hyperplane, and then you, you compute a phasor from that. Okay? So you just project it down, and then you just wrap it around the complex circle. And this complex number now becomes your random feature. Okay? And, and, and there's a squiggle mark here. Um, certainly, this relationship holds an expectation. Right? So certainly, this is true. Seems like some things would probably be better than others. For for this, so so the sampling scheme is given to you. Okay. Uh, the sampling scheme is draw from the Fourier transform of, of the kernel. Right, but you could draw regular samples as in a discrete transform, or you could just randomly sample. I think it's one better than the other. Or 
You could draw non-random samples? Yeah, I mean, you could draw like Yeah, so, so certainly this says that, well, so, so this says um, there exists a random sampling such that these two guys are close to each other. Um, sorry, a random sampling will probably produce something that's close to each other, and that implies that there exists uh, a, a deterministic sampling such that these two guys are close to each other. Um, the problem is I don't know how to come up with one. I know how to come up with one by just sampling, but I don't know how to, how to construct one. Okay, um, okay so, so the point of this was to show you that at least an expectation, um, featurizing your x and y and computing their inner product um, gives you something, gives you, gives you the kernel value. Okay? Um, I've also shown you how to compute the z. It's just draw a bunch of samples from the Fourier transform of the kernel and compute compute these phasers. What I really want, to want though is not these results and expectations. We want to show that this actually holds throughout the space. So let me, um, let me go through that um, right now. Let me, let me tell you what we, what we know how to do. Um, so we know that, that the inner product for a given x and y is going to be close to k of, k of x and y in expectation. But we can also show that the tails of this are quite light. Okay, so this is just by hoofing. So these guys, for a given x and y, aren't going to deviate very much with very high probability. Um, using the union bound on this, you can, you can show the same thing on a discrete data set of endpoints. Um, but even more so, using a covering number argument, you can show that this holds throughout the whole space. Okay, so, so if you draw enough, uh, if, if the dimensionality of your random feature is high enough, then then the, this inner product will approximate this kernel for all the points in your space with very high probability. Okay, so it's not just the result and expectation. This is actually a result that holds with very high probability throughout the whole space. Um, in fact, let me reinterpret that theorem for you. Um, so it says that um, with probability at least 1 minus p, p is some probability that you're given, um, the inner product of the whole space uh, approximates the kernel over the whole space um, with, with probability at least 1 minus p as long as you have enough, the dimension of your random feature is high enough, as long as you sample from the Fourier transform enough times. Okay, so this depends on um, linearly on the dimension of the space. Um, this is the standard epsilon squared dependence on the error over there uh, and the dependence on there's a dependence on the curvature of the kernel as well, as you might expect to see. But D, you have to pay for it runtime. So you don't want big D. That's right. That's right. And in fact, we'll see, um, I'll, I'll show you an experiment in the second part of the talk that um, I'll, I'll compare the, the cost of this D versus the cost of choosing these features optimally. Yeah? Can you just say what like, typical values of D are in your, in your concrete things? Yeah, why don't, I, why don't I just, when we get to the experiments, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so here's another random feature. So there was the Fourier random features. There's a di totally different class of random features um, that, that, that one can also construct. So you give me a kernel, and, and my job, again, to remind you, is to build a, a function, possibly a randomized one, such that the inner product between the featureized um, inputs is equal to the kernel. Okay, so, so this random feature works like this. Um, grid up your input space, your space of x's. So just lay down a random grid. I'll tell you how to pick the, sh uh, the pitch of the grid. In each bin of the grid, assign, um, assign, assign a binary bit string. Binary bit string is just the representation of the number of the grid in unary. Okay, so grid one gets a one over there, grid two, grid three, okay. And then, the random feature representation of a point is just its grid ID written in unary. Okay. That way when you compute the inner product, you're basically just one if you're in the same bin or zero if you're not in the same bin. And now all that's left is for me to tell you how to compute the, these random grid, grid pitches. Um, and, and in the same way that we picked the omegas from a Fourier transform of the kernel, here we define um, a hat transform of a kernel. Instead of sinusoids, it's in terms of these, these hat basis functions. Okay, so, so you randomly sample your, um, your grid pitches from 
from the hat transform of the kernel that you're trying to approximate. And again, you get the same, same theorems and same results as, as with the Fourier, Fourier kernel. So um, let, me, let me show you how this looks like in code. This is, it's very simple. Right? If, um, if you want to train a data set with, a, with an L2 loss, right? you want to train a classifier using an L2 loss with Fourier random features, you generate a, random, a bunch of random Ws. So these are the, you just sample from the Fourier transform of, say, the Gaussian kernel. Fourier transform of the Gaussian kernel is, again, a Gaussian. So you just draw a bunch of Gaussian Ws. And then you pass your data through to the random feature. So this is the complex sinusoid. And then, and then you just um, now fit a linear, linear solver. Uh, you just fit, fit a hyperplane to, uh, in this featureized space. And that's just the least squares problem. Backslash over here. OK. And boom, you have your, you have your hyperplane. That's, that, that's training in three lines of MATLAB code. And then for testing, um, you, you map your input vector through the, um, through the random map. And you, you evaluate the inner product with respect to the alpha that you just learned. So let's get to the issue of dimensions that you brought up. Um, so here's a bunch of data sets that we run this, this on. Um, so typical dimensions, anywhere from 21 dimensions to 127 dimensions on these data sets. Um, I'll show you higher dimensional data sets. Um, data set sizes range from a few thousands to a few million. And generally, training is really fast with these random Fourier features. And here are the typical dimensions that I picked. These are much smaller than what the theorem would predict. So the theorem is quite loose. Um, what would the theorem predict? The theorem would predict, um, well, so it depends what epsilon you want. But there's a 1 over epsilon squared. So if you wanted uh, accuracy of 1%, um, it'd be uh, 0.01 squared, right? So that's 1 over 0.01 squared. So it's 10,000. Okay, so. So we're getting into, uh, so, so the theorem is loose um, because of this guy right here. <clears throat> okay, so in practice, you know, we get um, typically better than state-of-the-art performance on, uh, on various heavily tuned SVM libraries. Um, the free random features work on most data sets. Uh, on some of them, uh, like the forest data set, um, it didn't work so well. And so, so this data set has this characteristic that if you actually were to train an SVM with um, RBF kernels on it, most of the points become support vectors. I'm sorry, what? Or the subjects test error? Test errors, yes. Sorry. There's two different flavors. There's the two class version and there's the seven class version. I suspect this is the two class version given the, the, the rate. Yeah, I, um, I took the, the version of the horse cover from these people here, from the core vector machine. Um, I just grabbed it from there and ran everything else on it. Um, anyway, so, so, so the point of this was, the point of this line is to, is to tell you that, that there are, that, 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 that there are uh, the, two free, the two random features are complementary in some sense. These are really good for learning really smooth decision surfaces. These are really good for doing nearest neighbors types of, of search uh, surfaces. Yeah? Uh, so how do you set capital D again? You set it to 500, see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> and then if it works really well, then you set it to 100. If it doesn't work really well, you set it to 1,000. And have you played with combining the, the two? Um, I, I have. Uh, I have, yes. Uh, so you just you can just. Stack up the random features for the two guys, and things work quite well. So is, it like the best of, is it the best of both worlds? Yeah, you tend to. I mean, so in the sense that that if you run it on all of these guys, you get basically the same performance. Uh, why does it perform better than the exact speed? Well, so there's an approximation going on. The approximation was in terms of the kernel, not in terms of the decision surface, or not in, not even in terms of the ideal decision surface. We really are learning a different surface. Um, it just tells you that, that the RBF representation isn't the best representation for these. 
and it could be that the hinge lock, you're also using regularized least squared classification, right? Yes. Um, so you, um, you get basically this. I've run all these stuff with all, all these things with the hinge loss as well. You basically get the same results. Um, and it stops, it stops to matter what loss you, you use when you have very large data sets. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, let, me, let me just uh, tell you a, little, a few of the properties of, of these things. So as you would expect, um, this is on the forest data set. If you, the bigger the data set, right? So big data sets help, but you knew that. Um, and also, as you would expect, as you increase the dimension of the random feature, your error also drops. So this is um, error dropping quite fast in training and testing time, not increasing um, very fast. So, so in practice, these things tend to, tend to have um, desirable properties. Let me, um, OK, so this is, this is random features. This was about training kernel machines faster. Um, let me generalize the problem. This is, this is where the random kitchen sinks come from. So we were learning these feature mappings based on a kernel that you give me. Um, but why, have, why start with a kernel in the first place? Uh, so back in the day, this is, this is a picture out of a, out of a paper by Block from 1962. Um, we had these neural networks. And, and there was this idea, just from day one, that there should be some randomization that happens at the first layer. Okay, so, so this idea of... of Having some randomization in, in your training algorithm is, is classical. Um, now, we don't draw our neural networks like this anymore. Uh, here's, here's maybe a more modern way of doing things. Um, here's your input. It goes through some nonlinearities. The nonlinearities have some parameters. And then you weight the output of the nonlinearities. And what you're, what you're learning during training is these weights and the parameters of the nonlinearities. And actually, this is also outmoded. We just write this now. Our neural network is, is a weighted sum of nonlinearities, and they're parameterized. And we just learn the weights and the parameters. Um, so let me focus on one popular way of doing it, of, of training these parameters. Um, so, so when you do ADA boosting, you build this function stage-wise. You train the alphas. You train the omegas. And then you do that for the next step, and so you have t of these stages. Um, in random features, we were also training a decision surface of a similar form. Our omegas were random, and we were just training for the alphas. Um, in kernel machines, we're also doing something similar, except instead of a finite sum, it's just an integral, and we're learning this function alpha. Okay, so, so a lot of these. Um, so basically, the world of machine of, of shallow network machine learning just all is focused on learning decision boundaries of this form. Uh, and I'm going to focus on one particular way of training these, and that's the greedy method, which goes back to well, it goes back about 50 years. Yeah. So the idea, and I'm going to focus on a function fitting framework. Okay, uh, forget the data set for now. Somebody gives you a function f star and says, please approximate it with a function of this form. You get to choose the omegas and the alphas. But I want the resulting sum to be, to be close to this function in some, in some norm in a function space. Okay, so you're given a function, a target function to approximate. And you're asked to come up with a bunch of weights and a bunch of parameters such that the, such that the weighted sum is, is close to the, to the target function. So the greedy approach, you know, which looks like ADA boost, looks like matching pursuit, um, looks like a lot of these other things, goes like this. Start with a function 0, and then we're going to find one term. We're going to add one term to the function. Um, and that's going to be the term that gets, the, the, the one term addition that gets us closest to f star. And now we have a new function. And then you, you iterate again. Uh, for, the next, for the next addition, for the next term in the function, you again come up with the one that, that uh, minimizes the difference between the residual and the target function, and you do this t times. Okay, so this 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 has the flavor of ADA boost, right? And we know a lot about the performance of um, a function fitting algorithms like this. And in fact, um, this result goes back 20 years, 25 years, 15 years, 15 years. Um, so suppose you want to approximate a function of this form. This is our target function. Um, it consists of an of infinitely many terms. 
And we want to approximate it with a t term function that we built as, as in the previous slide. So what's known is that the distance between the approximation that we built as in the previous slide and the target function decays as 1 over square root of the number of terms. And there's a constant here that measures, in some sense, the norm of the target function. So, so the, the, the L1 norm of the alphas is, is, um, is a norm on, on functions of this form. Okay. All right, so this is proved by, by induction over, the, over t. Uh, let, me, let me write this down graphically for you. Uh, it, says, it says that if you, for any function in this, in this space with uh, an infinite expansion, there exists a function with a t-term expansion if you're allowed to pick alpha and omega. That's not too far from that function. Okay. It's within 1 over square root of t. Okay. So, so it's a statement about for all functions in the blue, there exists a function in the purple. That's not too far. Okay. That's, that's about as good of a rate as you can get. This, this, this rate is, is tight. All right, so, so here's, what, here's another idea. This is the random kitchen sinks idea for, for fitting functions. You're again given the target function, and you're again asked to come up with alphas and omegas such that this, this t-term approximation is close to f star. Um, but now we do something much simpler. Just pick the omegas from some distribution just randomly instead of, instead of going through this greedy algorithm. There's nothing greedy about this now. Just pick them randomly. And then to pick the alphas, just, just solve this, this convex problem. Okay, so this looks like a least squares problem, for example. So all at once, not take twice. All at once. Right? It's a batch optimization over t alphas. Okay. So now, and then just return the alphas and the omegas that you compute. So, so let's see how well this does. And you would expect that, that the performance guarantees would somehow depend on the distribution that you use to sample the omegas, right? And so, and so here's, here's the result. Um, if you remember, um, the, the, resu the theoretical result for, for the greedy algorithm dependent, dependent on the L1 norm of, of, of the coefficients of the function we were trying to approximate, the C over here. Okay, so let's define an analogous norm for the target function we're trying to approximate. We're going to call it the p norm, and it's going to depend on the probability distribution they use to sample your, your, um, um, your parameters. Okay, so you could think of this as, a, as an important sampling ratio between the alphas and the distribution that you're using to sample these guys. Okay, so, so the theorem says, if somebody gives me an f star to approximate using the, 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 the algorithm I just showed you on the previous slide, then, then the t-term approximation with probability at least 1 minus delta for, for any delta that you pick um, also drops as 1 over square root of t. Okay. So we have the same rate in terms of the number of, of, um, of terms that we need in the expansion as we do with the greedy algorithm. But here, we just managed to sample the parameters uh, randomly. And then there's this dependence on the, on the importance ratio between the alphas and the p's. Yeah? So, so here, f star is, is you fix it, right? Yeah. And then in your picture before, I thought you said you had something that was uniform over all of them. So can you elaborate on yeah. that? Yeah. So, here's, so here's, here's, here's what this theorem says. OK. So you fix f star, and then, and then we're saying, um, so you fix f star, and f star is drawn from this big set that looks like that. It's, it's infinite expansions of, 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 of your uh, weighted features. Um, and we say that if you consider this random set, so this is a random set consisting of all alphas, all weights, um, but then these features are drawn randomly. It says that with very high probability, the, difference be the distance between this fixed f star and this set is, is drops as 1 over square root of t. Okay. So whereas before we were making a claim about for all points in the set, um, there is a point close to here. In this case, we're just saying for a fixed point in the set. Okay. And that's all you need to, to, talk about, to talk about function fitting. After all, somebody gives you a function to fit, and then you draw stuff. You don't need, 
you don't need to approximate the whole space ever. You just need to approximate the function at hand that you need to approximate. And that's why we managed to get this 1 over square root of t. Um, the rate of improvement is the same, but the difference in the, the, di the, di the constant could be substantial, right? This constant could be substantial, yeah. You could pick um, a sampling distribution for the weak learners, for the, for the features that's terrible for the given function. Yeah, it's easy to construct. And it's just, if you use a direct delta, for example, for your omegas, you, you just learn a really crappy classifier. Um, but at least the theorem is correct and that, that crappiness is reflected in this numerator here. Have you stored any win for doing any refinement at all? Because right now you're assuming you can just pick all random ones. If you heave out some fraction and replace them or something where you can do a little bit more, yeah. do you win? Um, what works really well is if you um, start with this random thing and then just do a few iterations of gradient descent on, uh, on the omegas and the alphas. So that works incredibly well. Um, of course, that sounds like a neural network. Of course, it's all a neural network. I just, <laughs> you just can't say that out loud. Oops. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, okay. So what 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 is neural? What is neat about it is that it's a neural network that you initialize with um, random weights, and you have guarantees about how far you end up from uh, from the thing you're trying to approximate. How far is that for the Um well, so it depends where you start with the training from scratch. Um, I'm not very good at it, uh, even though I've tried very hard. I often get stuck in local minima. Um, generally, you end up doing quite well if you, if you do this um, and then gradient descent. Um, in the experiments I'll report, um, I don't do the refinement, gradient descent refinement. Um, I've informally just tried um, training starting from zero or various parameters that I thought might be good. Um, and it works okay, uh, but nowhere near as well as this. Okay. Oh, and it's much slower because you need to run gradient descent for a lot longer. To and it's important to have the random, it's important to have the the random sampling, right? Because I've tried stuff like where the fees were for the PCA of the data set, and that didn't work well either. Yeah, yeah. So this, this random sampling is completely independent of the data, and that That's right. That's right. That's right. So it is a design issue. But then the PCA thing should have worked. The PCA, well, I don't know. I tried it once a decade ago. I don't know. So the, the reason this stuff ends up working well, and in, in my, my intuition about all of this stuff and what these theorems mean is that, is that really it doesn't matter what the nonlinearities are, but just put a lot of effort into figuring out what their weights should be. That's where the magic is. Not in here necessarily. That's 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 how I view this 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 the, this this result. And it's interesting because in, in in boosting, for instance, right, people have tried to do things that where instead of taking the greedy approach, you go and you take the you take the class first, you the weak squares that you fit, and then you go back and you try to do the least squares batch fit. Of yeah. This, and you end up doing much worse <laughs> yeah. in terms of generalization. Yeah. So it's interesting that here you're saying that in fact that batch thing is not very new. It's not hurting you because of the way we pick the weak learners, right? Right. Because they're random. Right? Because they're random, right. So you're talking about the Dale Sherman's result of, of yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't right. So if you pick your, 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 so Dale Sherman's result is if you pick the omegas from, from boosting, um, you don't want to go back and refine your alphas only. You got to go back and refine. Okay. All right, so uh, this theorem is in terms of some norm defined in, I mean, we, we can come up with a much stronger form of this theorem in terms of the L infinity norm of, between the functions. Um, but, but, these, but these features have to be um, sigmoids like this. Okay. Uh, again, this is, this is if you're, if you're going to nitpick about, about my choice of, of function norm here. Um, this gives you a result in terms of the L infinity norm. So you buy that it's enough to, to just fit uh, a fixed function in the space that you don't need a universal claim about the whole space? Did I did I convince you that this is a good enough thing? Let's take it off my. Cool.
great. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I'm going to skip the proof, uh, the proof idea. Um, it basically boils down to um, coming up with tail bounds for, for a zero mean random variable in a Banach space. It's a bounded zero mean random variable in a Banach space. Just replace this inf with this random variable. And, um, and then you apply standard results from there. Um, I'm, so everything I told you about so far about the random kitchen sinks was about fitting functions. Uh, but really, we're going to be fitting data and using a standard decomposition of the empirical risk, uh, sorry, of the defect between the empirical risk and the true risk, um, you can show this bound. So if, if f hat is the t-term expansion that you derived by looking at n data points and minimizing the empirical risk, then the true risk of f hat compared to the true risk of, uh, of, the, uh, of the best risk minimizer um, decays as follows. Okay, 1 over square root of t plus 1 over square root of the number of data points that you looked at. So, so the 1 over square root of t comes from the previous theorem. This 1 over square root of n is a standard um, result from, from learning theory. This is, um, no, it's not. It's not a uniform convergence result. This is, this is a, conver a result about this optimizer. It uses the uniform convergence for this part of the decomposition. Um, this part, as I, was uh, as I was talking with Ofer about, is, um, only, needs, only needs a point-wise convergence. Okay, so um, let's go over some, some experiments. Um, here's the adult data set. It's a relatively small data set, but everybody uses it. Um, uh, this is the number of terms that we add in the expansion. Uh, this is Adaboost's testing error. So after adding a few terms, about 40, 50 terms is enough for Adaboost, it plateaus out to about 15% error. For us, we need to draw a lot more random features to get to similar error rates. Okay, so so Adaboost got there faster with many, many, Adaboost got there with many fewer terms. We had to use a lot more terms to get to the same accuracy. But we got there much faster. Our optimization problem is much, much faster. Itaboost does this pretty heavyweight um, iterative thing where it has to touch more or less the entire data set at every iteration. We just touch the data set once in our, in our least square solution. So this is the runtime. As the number of features uh, increases, um, Itaboost takes a lot of time. This is on a log scale. Um, we take very little time. Um, and in fact, let me combine these two graphs together into this graph. This is the amount of training time versus the, the amount of error that you get. Okay. So even though we ended up using a lot, more, um, uh, a lot more terms in our expansion, we're still much, much faster because our optimization procedure is much faster for a given error rate. Um, here's another data set. This is data coming from an accelerometer from a hip-worn thing that detects your physical activity. Um, we stopped Adaboost after about 100 iterations because it just was taking too long. Um, too long. Whereas this thing, just the, the, the random kitchen sinks kept, kept, on, kept on ticking. And again, you have a couple of orders of magnitude uh, less time that you spent for the same error rate. Um, another standardized data set, similar thing. Again, a few orders of magnitude for, for similar error rates. And that's consistent across the board. Here's a, here's a face detection experiment. Um, we compared Adaboost with Haar wavelets against the Fourier random features. Um, what's neat about this comparison is, is that you can't train Fourier random features with Adaboost very well. It's a, it's a hard weak learner to fit. It's hard to fit uh, sinusoids to, to data, but we're picking them randomly in our case, so, so that's easy. Um, so, so part of the benefit of this random kitchen sink trick is that you can start using features that you wouldn't be able to use with Adaboost because you no longer need to fit them to data. It's, it's convenient. Um, so we get slightly better performance than Adaboost on, on, on our test accuracy 
training is much faster, um, seconds instead of minutes. Um, but we do use about a factor of 10 more in, um, in weak learners. And again, here's your point, John, about, uh, about how at runtime, um, D is what's important. Um, in these types of experiments, um, we, were, we were hoping to have a fast trainer. Um, and there are lots of tricks that we started using in a face detector that we built that can, um, that can avoid you having to slide the window, um, the, the, the detection window over the whole image. Um, there's, a, there's an optimization that happens where you can um, prune a lot of the search space for, for the sliding window in the space. So, so that's how we get around that kind of slowdown. Yeah. Have you <clears throat> tried to see, so when you, when you, you know, find the random features and then you help optimize the weights, then oh, you're doing these squares. But, so what, do you see any sparsity in these? Because it seems like you know, the way to overcome this would be to find a sparse set of alphas and then get rid of those random guys that you never use. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that's, that set of experiment, I don't report on them here, but um, one idea was instead of least squares, just use Pegasus and hope to get sparseness out of that. Um, I can't find a good setting of the parameters of Pegasus to get as good accuracy as I get with, with least squares. So, yeah, but then those problems become huge and I don't have a, I, I would like to ask you for, for a really large scale L1 regularized solver. I, I think there's a couple out there. I just don't, haven't talked to anybody who has, who's, who could just recommend one. Do you, offline? offline. Okay. Um, similar things with MNIST. Um, and this one we were comparing against boosting by filtering, which is a uh, much faster version of boosting, where you, uh, instead of touching the entire data set at every iteration, you just touch a random subset of it. Um, and again, you see similar types of results where um, you're about 100 times faster, similar accuracy, um, but you use more features. Um, I'm going to skip this. So this is. Um, I can't really talk about this part, but I think it's neat that Intel may consider um, using this in something <laughs> one day. Um, right. Uh, so here's, here's the lesson um, for, from this part of the talk. Um, so here's typically people, the way people fit these nonlinear decision boundaries. Um, you run a minimization over the weights, you run a minimization over the parameters, and I just, here's a caricature, this is not mathematical. Right? Um, the, the caricature of what we've done is, is minimize over these weights, but randomize over the, the omegas, and prove that you get very similar results. So for the next few minutes, I wanna talk about uh, less baked things that, that I've been working on for the past six months or so. Um, Unless there are questions about, about that stuff where we can. So here's, here's, here's a neat trend. Everybody is doing semi-definite programs for everything um, and getting good results as long as they have 10,000 variables. Um, so it'd be neat to come up with a way to solve semi-definite programs faster. So these semi-definite programs typically take this form. You want to minimize a convex function over matrices subject to a polyhedral constraint. So there's a linear constraint on the matrix. And you want the matrix to be positive definite. Okay, so, so this blue thing is, 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 represents the cone of positive definite matrices. Um, and the problem is, while it's, it's polynomially, only polynomially hard to, to perform minimizations like this, um, it's still, it's, still, uh, it's still hard to do it on computers today. Uh, we don't have very fast solvers. So, so it's a challenge to come up with, with good solvers that, that, uh, that can minimize things over this, this convex cone. So a trick that Guillermo Bozinski pointed out to me that they'd used in a paper is to replace this set in the optimization with a polyhedral set. They use a random polyhedral set. That's the green thing over here. Okay, so you just generate a bunch of random vertices um, that are positive definite matrices, and you require x to live in that cone. Um, and it worked amazingly well for them for their application. Um, 
and, and, and they didn't know why it worked well. And uh, I ran a bunch of experiments, and, and it looks like, you know, um, seems to work well for as long as your optimum is not on the wall of this cone, as long as it's not an extreme point of this cone, it'll work amazingly well. And if it is on the extreme point, then you can still get within, you know, some epsilon of it with high probability. So what can we say about this type of, uh, this type of thing? Um, so here's a theorem about it. Actually, before the theorem, let me tell you, let me tell you how one uses this trick. Um, so we just replaced the positive definiteness constraint with this constraint. This is the, this is the, cons the constraint that x has to lie in this polyhedral cone whose vertices are these randomly drawn vi's. And, and just to say that it's a cone means that uh, these weights have to be positive. Okay, so, so now if f, is, if f is linear, for example, this turns into a linear program. If f is quadratic, this is a quadratic program. You can solve all of these things really fast. Um, and this graph is a simulation that shows that actually uh, <clears throat> a lot of these matrices that you draw from this positive definite cone um, do end up being extremely close to this uh, random convex po uh, polyhedral cone. <clears throat> so the theorem is, um, and it's still in flux, um, I think some of it can be improved, um, is that if, you, if you're given a target matrix x naught, so for fixed x naught, um, draw a bunch of random positive definite matrices from the Wishart distribution. Construct this cone. Okay, so this is just positive combinations of, of these random Wishart matrices. Then with really high probability, the target matrix is close to this uh, convex polyhedral cone as long as the number of random points that you drew is large enough. And large enough, of course, depends on how accurately you want to approximate the target matrix. And it also depends on, on this guy, which, which quantifies how close the target, the target matrix is to the boundary of the, of the convex cone. Okay. So with this, you, you, just, you now have a tool to convert um, hairy semi-definite programs into, into optimization problems over random polyhedral cones, like, like just turning a semi-definite program into a random linear program. Um, so that's, that's one thread of research. Here's, um, here's another thread of research that um, I don't know if it's going to pay off, but, but it's all sci-fi and it feels good to work on it. Um, so it turns out if you take a normal CPU and you drop its voltage, below the voltage that, that, that the instruction manual tells you to, to run it at, the CPU will still run, but it'll make mistakes. Okay. So, um, and you save a lot of power. Power consumption drops somewhere between uh, V squared and V cubed. Okay. Why do you, why don't the classical scalars be squared? Right, but you get to drop the clock. Oh. There's, there's, there's a dependence on the clock. Sure, sure, sure. C squared F, yeah. Um, so, so wouldn't it be neat if, if the next processors that you, actually, I'm totally not allowed to say it that way. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it be neat if in the laboratory, somebody were allowed to, somebody were to build a processor whose floating point unit ran at a lower voltage, um, saved a lot of power, um, but made some mistakes here and there, or made a lot of mistakes. Um, so actually, that's, that's explored. Uh, this is, this is uh, not an entirely new idea. People have been building, have been prototyping um, these, uh, these circuits where, where they, they're designed normally. And when you drop them at low voltage, they have this, um, this little shadow latch that detects whether the circuit is, is misbehaving. And if, and if the circuit detects that it's misbehaving, then it'll flush the instruction pipeline and reissue the, the instruction anew and raise the voltage a little bit higher. Okay? So, so this, is, this is the hardware approach at, uh, at resilience on, on under-volted processors. Yes? If, if it's a floating point unit, the unit can just deliver a NAN and let, and let uh, the algorithm take care of it later, and at least not, not cause the FDIV bug, which I'm sure you know about, I, I've or at least the results it. thereof. I've, I've heard about it, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so there are various ways to, to, to notify the, the software layer that, that an error has occurred. There are ways to mask it at the hardware layer by just 
um, reissuing the instructions and not letting the software worry about it. Um, but but here's, here's another idea. Let's just get rid of the overhead of this shadow latch. That's, that's taking up power, it's taking up um, die area, and it may even force you to run stuff at high voltage just to get the shadow latch to work correctly. Um, and let's expose all the errors to the software. Um, the floating point unit will, will not just return NANDs when it's made a mistake, it'll just return the garbage that it computed. It'll just say A plus B is equal to something totally random. But now let's design our algorithms so that they can tolerate that type of error. So here's, here's the idea. Um, so let's start with a classical combinatorial problem, say bipartite graph matching. Okay, so this is a um, standard problem. Um, let's express it as a, as a linear program and then convert the linear program into an optimization problem that's unconstrained. And then, so, so none of this involves computation. This is all pen, uh, pen and paper um, transformations. And then to, to solve uh, a bipartite graph matching problem, let's just toss this unconstrained optimization problem into a stochastic gradient solver. The reason is that stochastic gradient we know can tolerate noise in the gradients. So whenever we compute the gradient, which is where you spend the bulk of the computation when you're doing this type of minimization, drop the voltage. Feel free to compute a really noisy gradient and then do the update at, 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 at normal voltage. Yeah, so it depends, it depends uh, what regime um, you're in. If, if you're in a regime slightly below design voltage, the errors that you get are, are timing errors. Um, and they're random only in the sense that, that um, they they're hard to model, um, in that they're, uh, they, the result that you get out of the FPU depends on the previous result that the FPU returned. But if you're far below that, then you actually get transistor noise, which, which is more naturally modeled as, as a stochastic source. Um, and here's, here's some preliminary results. Um, this is quite preliminary. Um, so we, we built um, these, this, this hardware simulator that actually has a spark processor on an FPGA and then the FPGA injects noise into the output of the floating point unit. Um, so here's a least square solver. This is just the least square solver from OpenCV. Um, if you drop the voltage of the CPU and inject all these errors, um, the least square solver starts returns um, returns really noisy results. Okay, so this is this is the the, the difference between the output of the least square solver running at low voltage and the optimum. Okay, and you just get these very large residuals. Um, but using our stochastic gradient solver, um, no matter what the error rate, you just nail the result eventually. Um, similar thing with um, bipartite graph matching. If you use OpenCV's um, Earth Mover's Distance Solver. Um, at, at low voltages, it'll do quite poorly, whereas ours does, um, well, it doesn't get 100% yet because there's a bug. Um, but basically, its performance doesn't depend on the amount of error that you inject. So we really just, uh, we are taking longer to compute, to compute these results because stochastic gradient is obviously slower than than say the, the simplex method or, or the SVD in this case. Um, but at least we're getting robustness right now. Yes? For the floating point unit, a single bit error can multiply the result by, by, a few hundred, by a few hundred orders of magnitude. Yeah. It doesn't happen or you can recover or what the deal? It does happen and we can recover. Wow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um, yes? Do you have a comparison between like the time lost and the amount of power you save? Um, so what I can what what it, what I do know is that from here to here um, corresponds to about um, power savings of uh, so so this uses about two percent of the power savings two percent of the power uh, and this uses uh, about a hundred percent of the power. Okay, so it's a factor of a hundred in power savings. Um, the amount of time that you spend is just ridiculous. This is just not a worthwhile technique right now. Okay, so you end up waiting 
uh, you end up using up a lot more power right now just because you keep running this, this stochastic gradient solver for, for too long. Oh, so you use more energy. You end up using more energy at the end because you're waiting for your computation. Um, but the trick is, so, so this is the motivation for, for us to develop um, faster stochastic solvers. Right? Instead of just following the gradient, let's, let's, do, um, let's, let's try um, conjugate gradient methods or, or um, second order methods or anything other than the gradient direction probably will help. Yeah. There are some very low res resolution floating point numbers, like a rhythmic data at about 8 bits. Yes. So, in other words, codex. If yes. you can use that, you yes. must, on the right hardware, maybe interest. That's right. That's right. So, an alternative is to just compute, have, have your FB be, be narrower and then stitch the output together later. Um, I wanted to, before, before I, I get on my pontification slide, I wanted to acknowledge some, some collaborators. Um, from, from various universities, um, and a lot of people who I've talked to about this stuff over the past couple of years who've, who've been very helpful. <clears throat> so I, um, part of the flavor of this talk was about um, randomizing things instead of optimizing things, and just about generally doing less work and hoping that your random number generator will, will just get you the right answer, and it turns out we can prove that it often does. Um, and I don't, I, I like digging back into the back liter literature and finding the root of some of these ideas like you saw with the neural network picture. And I was trying to figure out why more people don't randomize things. And my literature search there <laughs> took me to the original source. Um, and there's support for both ways of doing things, of optimizing really hard or just throwing caution to the wind. And I can open for questions if you, if you'd like. I probably won't be able to answer most of these. <laughs> Don't ask me. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Four, but if you reduce voltage by thirty percent, I can see you reduce power by a factor of two. But a factor of twenty. Either it's megahertz or it's black magic. Well, so, cer so certainly, um, uh, if, you, if you drop voltage by a factor of two, yeah, no. you're, you're dropping power by a factor of four. Yeah. So, um, but you also get to run your clock more slowly under this scheme. You can run the clock slowly at that full voltage, too. Fine. I can see, we, I can, I can see underclocking uh, your user's power. Yeah. That, that, that's fairly standard. I, I'm sorry. I, yes, yes. Um, but the rest of it is either black magic or the, or the megahertz. Well, so I, 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 I failed to actually manifest any black magic here because I, I admitted to you that, that, that these stochastic gradient solvers actually end up taking a long time. Right? So, so um, don't, don't, don't be too impressed by these results and don't, don't think I'm, I'm some voodoo master. Um, this is just a first step toward, toward getting, to, to, toward a, an algorithmic way to tolerate noise in numerical algorithms. Um, the, the rest of it, this idea of, of, making, of, of becoming resilient to undervolting, um, that's, that's standard and classical. People have been solving this at the circuit level for, for a decade now. The, the, the innovation is to do this at the software level using tricks from, from the machine learning community. Yes? Uh, in the boosting versus randomization experiment, you mentioned the boosting thing didn't actually look at the whole data set. Just look at a, like a random subset. I was wondering why that didn't help more. And also related to if, uh, if you can prove things about randomized greedy schemes. Or yeah. Um, so the, um, actually, um, Joseph Bradley is the one who came up, has, has all the results on, on randomized boosting schemes. Uh, boosting by filtering is his work. Um, he has bounds on, on how well it does. And there, again, you get the 1 over square root of t type of thing. Um, and my sense is that you, you just, when you're, when you're going to train a, a weak learner, you just need to look at the data if you're going to pick the weights using the greedy AWS method. But you need a little tiny bit of data. That's that, right. So that's almost random. Right. So that's, that's their trick, right? So, so if, if you will, um, they are picking their, their weak learner um, 
randomly, just like, just like I do, except they pick it by looking at a random sub. Their randomization is by looking at a random subset of the data. Um, the way they add these weak learners to the final function is, is by the stage-wise thing. And I'm still insisting that, that the stage-wise thing is what kills you. And the stage-wise thing is only you're, you're, you're fitting on the entire data set once you pick the, I'm not sure. The stage-wise thing is that when you, pick, when you pick the weight, the optimum weight for the weak learner that you just learned, you're, you're again looking at, at a subset of the data set. You're always just looking at a subset of the data set in the stage-wise thing. Yeah? Have you tried to know the voltage? But when you're uh, testing the function? No. And when you're training? Um, in, in this work, you mean? Yes. So there's no testing and training here. This is. That you're like trying to feed the function. Right? Yeah. Uh, here, no. This is just oh, okay. a, a, a randomly generated least scores ah, okay, problem. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. It's there's no there's no don't think of it as a machine learning problem. Okay. It's, uh, the stochastic gradient is a machine learning tool, but there's no data fitting going on. Okay. okay.